Hello, <coughs> okay. Hello, everyone. This will be our next session of programmer presentations. As, as you can hear, it might be somewhat painful for all of us. So I do apologize for this. Um, but uh, this, uh, this topic is too important to be uh, left to uh, the uh, mercies of viruses and sore throats. Uh, in particular, since uh, we are dealing with verifying the integrity of uh, important systems, uh, maybe one day the extended human body will verify snug hoofs before accepting new biological material into it to make sure that it's not malicious. And uh, towards that grand vision in that application and many others, um, let's discuss some of the ways that the backends that we discussed at length yesterday can be used for virus applications uh, and additional techniques to those that uh, Mike described in the previous talk. So the problem is how to represent the computations or computational statements that we are making. And as we saw, the uh, state of the art SNARKs um, are able to support arbitrary uh, statements uh, expressed as uh, uh, instances in uh, NP languages, uh, but they do so in a somewhat awkward way uh, in the language of QAPs. And you have to think hard about how to express your computation with a bunch of polynomials with some quadratic constraints that happen to be satisfiable. Um, it, it is possible, it is even possible to do it in real time on the board, as Mike showed us, but um, it's not what, uh, would, uh, what people would use uh, when SNARKs take over the world and are used for numerous applications. We need higher level representations. So we can move to the language of circuits and talk about, uh, well, circuits uh, that uh, get some input, uh, X and Y, to use the previous uh, sessions notation, claiming that f of x equals y, and the witness would be some assignment to its internal values, including non-deterministic choices z. Or you can restate that as uh, a circuit with x and y fakes that needs to verify some witness w. And now the programmer is left uh, having to write the, the circuit, uh, maybe an arithmetic circuit for compatibility with uh, the QAPs, or a Boolean one for compatibility with what we used to. And, um, well, circuits are slightly easier to think about, but not, that, not, not ideal. What is ideal, the way that most of the human race is writing computer programs is in high level languages, like C or even higher level languages. And we would really like to be able to express our statements as a simple C program. And then the statement would be that a specified C program, when executed on a given input, produces a certain output given some additional inputs uh, that we're not supposed to know about, um, that would be the uh, NP witness. And, and that's great, because everybody knows how to write C programs, some of us even write them correctly, and once we have a correctly expressed C program, we can uh, uh, ideally plug them in and verify uh, whatever we're able to express in that language. Uh, for example, we may uh, write a C program that uh, expresses some statement about monetary computations. Um, very, read very carefully to make sure that it checks just the right things about those computations. And then um, plug it in and magically enforce security in some financial system. Um, now, note uh, throughout this discussion, we had some uh, stuff highlighted in purple, and that denotes the parts that are supposed to stay on the prover side. The witness for the computation, the assignment, internal values, wherever you are in, the, in this uh, sequence of reductions. Um, and often we will want to, it to stay on the, on the prover side for efficiency reasons if it's long, or for privacy reasons exploiting the zero knowledge property of the snark. And this will come up in some of the applications. Now, in this talk, we'll be uh, discussing uh, the front end uh, and applications uh, with particular approaches, in particular the uh, front end for C programs and the application for a certain financial system. Now, um, let's start with discussing SNUCs for general C programs. And this slide very simplistically summarizes the state of the art. Uh, first, uh, I'm looking only at uh, works on uh, general C programs. Uh, there are many, many works on other program representations, including special cases of C programs. 
Um, so this is far from comprehensive. In particular, I'm excluding the works that Mike talked about in the previous session. Um, but just for, uh, for some historical context, so in principle, C program, that's all in MP, so Killian Mikali problem solved. Um, and uh, we know that it can be done with CS proofs. We know uh, by the work of growth that it can, uh, that it can be done also with, without random oracles, but with suffi sufficiently preposterous uh, non-falsifiable assumptions. Um, and that gives us a way to um, a verify a single computation, um, and it's feasible in the, in the sense that there exists polynomial time algorithm under some assumptions such that the security properties hold and the viciously properties are asymptotic. Now, it's possible to extend this notion from a single computation to also to a network of interactive computations. Um, this is something that we'll be discussing in my next session uh, through the notions of recursive composition, also called bootstrapping, in proof carrying data. Um, that well, what was observed more recently, but still at the level of, uh, okay, it's possible to do it in principle under some assumptions. Originally, some uh, hardware token assumptions. Nowadays, uh, cleanly stated cryptographic assumptions. That's, that's the, best, the best we can say about this. Um, now there's a matter of um, dealing with um, implementations, and uh, this is more recent. Uh, it only go back, goes back two or three years uh, to the work of uh, to the Pinocchio implementation and uh, the uh, Tiny RAM implementation that I'll describe shortly. Um, uh, sorry, that oh, yeah, okay, um, not sorry. So. Um, that goes. Uh, that that shows us actual implementation with fast verification, uh, and uh, it supports uh, a C programs, but only for small C programs. Uh, there are problems when you deal with large programs. There's dependence on the on the program side with a significant blow up, and uh, also it doesn't scale very nicely. Once the program uh, running time grows, uh, basically memory consumption blows up uh, super linearly in the program runtime. Um, the uh, program size issue can be solved by more work and, uh, the, and the scalability issue, uh, the memory consumption as program size grows, sorry, program running time grows, can also be solved uh, and all, uh, moreover the, uh, that vision of uh, extending things to a network of multiple interactive computations, a distributed setting, that also uh, solvable in practice, and we actually have working implementations for all of these degrees of freedom. We have a system that implements, that implements all of these uh, in the asymptotic sense and in the, uh, um, let's call it the semi-practical sense of running fast enough for the benchmarks to be complete in time for the submission deadline. Um, we'll, this, we'll be discussing the concrete performance and what it might still be good for later. The big challenge, of course, is uh, dealing with the, uh, the prover efficiency. Um, that's an open problem in all of these, and uh, as uh, Mike showed, the more functionality we want, the more we end up paying in terms of uh, proving runtime. So let me start by describing um, the basic implementation and the uh, underlying philosophy of uh, in the CPU-like approach to uh, the front end, in particular verifying C programs and the random access machine computation. Uh, these are works with Eli Ben Sasson, Alessandro Chiesa, Daniel Genkin, Adar Svirza, um, over several papers. And there is an additional uh, team of students and programmers involved in some of them. Uh, you can uh, check the references and uh, a website, which I neglected to mention, but uh, the uh, I'll add the link in the next slide. Um, and jumping ahead, the bottom line of this work uh, is that the, the correct execution of arbitrary C programs can be verified. Ver verification uh, takes a few milliseconds regardless of the program size and running time. And uh, the proof size is 288 bytes. Okay, so that's the take home message. And I'm hiding some uh, second order parameters, but Morally, this is it. Um, 
So let's see how these uh, SNARKs for C work. Uh, and these will be zero knowledge SNARKs, that's a feature. And the are preprocessing SNARKs, that's a bug that we'll be discussing later. So the parameters will be such for any C program that uh, runs for T cycles. What does it mean for a C program to run for T cycles? I mean, C is not defined in terms of cycles. Well, think of a natural conversion to your favorite reasonable programming language, and it will probably be tied up to a small constant, and we'll be fixing a particular one shortly. So uh, the preprocessing by the generator, which generates the proving and verifying key, also called the common reference string, because it's, uh, it has private randomness. That takes time, that is t log t, so quasi-linear in the original program's running time. And um, the provers generation is also quasi-linear, but uh, a t log square t, uh, due to an extra level of reduction in the way. And um, let's see, oh yeah, in the verification time, uh, well, that's the good news, is uh, essentially linear in the size of the input to the program. Um, and uh, the dependency is very low, so for inputs of reasonable size, say thousands of bits, it's a few milliseconds. And the proof size for 128-bit security um, is 288 bytes, that's come from the underlying SNARK, and conveniently that fits in a TCP packet. So just think about it, you can run something on the cloud for a year, and a single TCP packet coming back will convince you of the result. <coughs> So how does this work? Um, to get these results, we, uh, as always in this land of snarks, go through a series of reductions. This time we start with C programs. And uh, we want to convert this ultimately into a uh, one CS format and then plug it into uh, the, uh, the rest of the chain of reductions that I described yesterday. Now, uh, C programs are too, too complicated to work with. We need a simpler notation that we can start uh, uh, writing uh, con simple constraints for. And um, the first step is uh, in our approach is to um, um, uh, convert this into uh, a circuit uh, represent. Sorry, to convert this into assembly representation. Very simple instructions instead of general C language. Though libraries, function calls, recursions, uh, none of that complicated stuff. Um, we end up with uh, some simple assembly in a very simple processor that we defined called TinyRAM. We'll discuss it shortly. Um, then we convert uh, this assembly representation into a circuit that checks the uh, correctness of execution of the assembly program. <coughs> And uh, we convert that circuit into the L1CS representation um, uh, that we plug into the uh, SNARKs described yesterday. So this is the natural thing you, that you would expect. And, and actually, we don't really do that. I cheated here. We uh, don't build a, an explicit circuit and then convert it down. We actually have uh, shortcuts uh, that uh, directly create L1CS. From, uh, for verifying the assembly code. And the reason for that is that um, there is extra power in R1CS that is uh, discarded when you move to the circuit representation. To name one, R1CS can uh, represent a linear constraint, say uh, this, uh, the weighted sum of some variables is four in a single constraint, regardless of the weights and the number of variables. So um, to use that power, we actually skip that, and uh, we um, have a gadget library that encapsulates many of those tricks to make it possible to uh, program in kind of a hybrid re representation somewhere in between circuits and L1CS. Now, the, uh, this starts with um, um, uh, the C program and converts it using a compiler. The compiler is uh, a customized GCC version that we built, basically creating a new backend for a new architecture. Uh, but what is that architecture? So um, it's 
tempting to just uh, pick one of the existing architectures like x86 or ARM, AVR, and so on. Uh, there are even some open source architectures nowadays. Um, but um, there's a cost to that. The cost is that uh, we want a very simple instruction set that is easy to verify because we will end up writing circuits or R1CS constraints for checking the correctness of the execution on that processor. On the other hand, we do want an architecture that is sufficiently powerful for the computation to stay short uh, because the running time of the computation is that big T also comes into the performance. So clearly that there's a trade-off between the two. Um, and um, if you look at the uh, existing architectures, we weren't very happy with any of these and we ended up choosing, uh, so defining a new architecture called TinyRAM that is, gives us a good trade-off between the two. Um, okay, this is the slide that I was missing earlier. Um, and this is what uh, TinyRAM looks like. It's, uh, it's a small set of uh, instructions. Uh, you can squint and try to read them or you could just uh, look at the spec, or even believe me that essentially all this has is a bunch of registers and memory access instructions, uh, logical operations and arithmetic operations on registers, signed and unsigned comparison branches, uh, and reading non-deterministic advice, putting out, put otherwise a special input, that means that the program has some uh, non-deterministic uh, string to take care of, uh, uh, sorry, to, to use in order to uh, complete the computation. That would be the W or Z later on. And uh, the, the tiny ramp achieves this, uh, the, the goal that we set for it in the sense that the code size is comparable to x86 and the execution time in terms of the number of instructions, not prove a running time, just number of instructions to represent the program is also close to x86. And jumping ahead, we'll end up um, uh, having uh, just a, on the order of a thousand gates, less than a thousand gates per time RAM instruction. And, and let's think about it for a minute. We are logically, in terms of uh, the progress of the processor, running nearly as fast as x86 using just a thousand gates or constraints or uh, per, uh, per cycle. How can this be? The x86 architecture is huge. Um, even the original uh, 8086 uh, uh, had uh, many, many thousands of uh, uh, transistors. Uh, modern x86s are billions of transistors. How can we do it with just a thousand transistors? And there's magic here, and that magic is um, that of non-deterministic advice. Because we are not really doing the computation of the C program, but only checking a previous execution, then we can ask, as part of the witness, to know the intermediate values of that computation. We are just checking that values are, are correctly related to each other and not computing them. So, for example, uh, if you're doing a multiplication, well, actually, computing a multiplication in, in ASIC for Intel requires taking care of carries. And the carries have this uh, dependency as they go up the chain, so you need the logarithmic depth circuit for that. But um, we don't need that because um, we can just guess the carries and make sure that they are consistent and it all works. And we'll give many examples of this later. So the third consideration in the choice of architecture is that it is uh, friendly towards non-determinism and indeed has a small representation not just for execution but especially for verifying the execution. Um, now this is a good time to go to those, uh, to go back to a bit of motivation unfortunately, whoops, unfortunately slightly misplaced but uh, related to our discussion right now. Why did we ever even go to, uh, to the CPU representation? So we could stick with the ASIC approach um, as described in the previous session, but uh, there are several pro problems here. One is dealing with random access memory, um, things like array access and the pointer dereference, which are rather popular in C programs, 
And in the general case, where these are really random looking, say, data dependent in complicated ways, um, well, the uh, power approaches mainly use multiplexers to uh, have a huge uh, a var array of variables as part of the state and uh, constraints that implement a multiplexer that chooses the right one. That's a huge overhead per axis. Another issue is uh, loops uh, with data-dependent number of iterations or similarly recursions with data-dependent depth. Um, that those have to be unrolled to the worst case, but as we saw, sometimes you can do uh, very smart tricks um, but they, to uh, make the best of the worst case. Either, uh, but there's, there's um, no recourse to, uh, to other than uh, unrolling them to have enough constraints to, to uh, uh, capture everything. Then there's nasty stuff like go to that could, could, could uh, throw uh, control flow around arbitrarily, and even if you care about it, self modifying code. So, f of course, once we move to uh, the CPU approach, uh, like TinyRAM, it's all taken care of. So, um, the next stage is to actually uh, generate these, um, in these circuits that check TinyRAM programs. So moving from tiny run to circuit set, here I go back to the original lie and uh, pretend that we're building circuits rather than R1 CSs. Um, I'll mention uh, a, a, a few places where this nice abstraction breaks. So we are going to be presented where we is a circuit that checks the computation. We are going to be presented with an input that uh, this, uh, describes uh, what goes into the computation, the input to the C program, the thing it reads it use, using uh, scanf instructions, essentially. And um, for simplicity, let's assume that uh, uh, the output is just accept, because if, if we know, uh, if you want a different output, we could just add it, to append it to the input, and ask the program to verify that uh, the result of running the original program or the input is consistent with the claimed output. And um, the, in addition, there will be some non-deterministic advice provided uh, to the C program using that dedicated instruction. <coughs> and all of these will be uh, going into a sequence of instructions that, they executed, that the CPU executes step by step. Um, so at time t, there is the program counter and a bunch of registers um, representing the state. And the program counter will point to some instructions. We are fixing the program now. And those instructions might read the inputs or the witnesses or whatever. So we can summarize everything that happens from the perspective of the CPU into this table of CPU states sorted by time. Um, note that we don't include memory in this case, we are, uh, uh, nor the inputs, uh, nor, those, uh, nor the additional witness input. Uh, it will just show up in the state whenever we access it. We will take care of it later. And our goal is to design a circuit that, um, 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 that is satisfiable for the, a given trace where trace denotes this uh, time-sorted uh, list of CPU states, um, the circuit is satisfiable if and only if this trace is code consistent, meaning every uh, evolution, every step, from step i to step i plus one, uh, obeys the semantics of the tiny RAM processor as defined in a, in a, in a simple specification. Now, we also have to make sure that things are memory consistent, but otherwise what we store into memory is what we read. And we also need verified consistency with the inputs. Um, we'll take care of that in, in momentarily. So to take care of code consistency, uh, we build a sub-circuit. Um, let's call it uh, CTF, or transition function. And this circuit checks every individual uh, transition. It, it, it gets its input the incoming state uh, and the outgoing state uh, and make sure that the two obey the semantics. Um, it doesn't check uh, the um, content of mem memory reads because it has nothing to check about. It, for now, it just believes that whenever a read happens, the correct value showed in memory. This will be verified by additional sub-circuits. 
And then we duplicate this uh, transition function circuit for every transition, for but otherwise we have uh, t copies of it. Um, now there are a bunch of techniques going in here. Where there's uh, there's a register file uh, as part of the state, and we need to uh, have to emulate uh, instruction fetching, and then register accessing the register file, and uh, then doing the ALE operations, and a bunch of other things like updating the program counter and branches. There's some engineering effort there, and some uh, back and forth with the definition of tiny RAM to uh, tighten these. Um, and then there's the question of how can we believe memory the memory fetches? Um, how do we know that what we get after a store is indeed the thing that was stored? And there are various approaches to this. And one is to just maintain a snapshot of the whole memory for each time step, but otherwise extend uh, the um, state to contain not just the registers, but also the random access maintaining the uh, heap and stack of the C program. Uh, of course, this is uh, okay. This is straightforward. We can now extend the function to check consistency, also of the memory. Make sure that uh, all values are identical between adjacent uh, steps, except for ones that were read to, and that every time a memory read happens, it's consistent with the correct value in memory. But of course, it, of course, it's grossly inefficient, especially if the memory size is very is much larger than the program size. This will dominate the cost. So, at the very least, we'll have t times s. Uh, dependence uh, where s is where is the um, so, uh, sorry n times s where n is the program uh, the n is the memory size and uh, t as before is the running time uh, and if the memory is as large as the running times that's the gen uh, the general case for random access machines they could spend all, most of their time writing to new memory cells then that means uh, t squared cost. We're after t log t, so this can't work. OK, um, so we could uh, just restrict the memory addresses to known constants, but otherwise not support data dependent memory accesses. That's what happened in the original Pinocchio implementation. So it did not support full C, uh, in particular, no pointers and array accesses. Um, you could. Uh, in, uh, later variants of the uh, Pinocchio approach uh, and system do add multiplexers uh, and, of course, the fancier techniques that uh, Mike mentioned. Another approach um, is, to, um, um, is to think about this as follows. We have this CPU here that uh, is verified. So we can trust the SNARK to uh, correctly check the transitions of the CPU. But this CPU has a problem. Whenever it accesses memory, arbitrary stuff comes out, whereas it really wants the value that it previously wrote to uh, come up on reads. And this situation of a CPU with an untrusted storage has been studied before. This is the uh, online memory checking problem of uh, Blamital. And uh, the technique for, their technique for dealing with that is to use Merkle trees, um, as uh, I hope Many of you are aware who, are, who is familiar with online memory checking or Merkle trees for memory checking. So this is a very elegant idea. Um, we have the uh, contents of the memory cell, of the memory cells. Um, let's suppose we have all of eight memory addresses. And we are going to uh, put these in a binary tree. where every node in the tree contains a hash function evaluation of your favorite hash function. And eventually, there is the root. Now, this whole thing will be stored in the external, untrusted memory. But the root that will also be stored in our trusted CPU. Now, suppose that this environment is indeed maintained, that uh, all of these values indeed correct contain the content hash function evaluations, and uh, the memory uh, is accessed by a read instruction. Say this instruction, uh, the instruction accesses this memory access, this memory address here. 
Um, so uh, a value shows up in the Kanye Ryan register, but it could be false. But there is actually a way to prove that it is, it's the correct value, and that is by um, letting the CPU check the consistency with this hash by providing this extra value that allows it to compute this hash, this extra value that allows it to compute this hash, and then the root is derivable. Um, so there's uh, extra information of uh, logarithmic size appended to every memory axis, and um, it can be checked at logarithmic cost, and it follows from collision resistance of the hash function that uh, it's impossible to uh, cheat. So that's feasible in, in general, and the uh, observation that uh, this is applicable uh, in the SNARK setting uh, was made by uh, BCGT. Um, and um, that's possible. It's, it's actually something that we used uh, in some systems. But there is the catch that uh, it does require expensive hash function evaluations, a logarithmic number of them, for every memory access. And we want something even tighter that does not use crypto as part of the circuit. Now, what I mean, not using crypto, all of this is about crypto. We're going to use pairings and uh, cryptographically strong fields and um, unfalsifiable assumptions. Everything will be crypto. Well, yes, yes, but that is in the back end. This, now we're talking about what we are plugging into the back end. And so far, there was nothing cryptographic. The point is that uh, cryptographic stuff tends to be expensive, especially the public key crypto or even hash functions in our case. And when you take that, something expensive and put it as part of the statement that you are going to prove, the statement that you are putting into the backend, then you get the overheads of the backend on top of the overheads of what you put in, and then it blows up. So um, we want a different approach that uh, avoids crypto, uh, an information theoretical approach, if you will. Um, and that's the alternative one uh, presented by uh, BCGT. That was a theory paper later if implemented. Um, and uh, the idea is to uh, also consider the, uh, an alternative representation of the computation, sorted not by time, but by memory address. So it would look like this. Uh, you would have uh, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of records. Each says that, say, at uh, time 11, uh, there was a store of the value 100 into memory address 0 by some instruction. And uh, this is sorted by, uh, by the address as primary index and then by time as secondary index. With this representation, it's actually very easy to check uh, the correct evolution uh, by writing a, a, another subcircuit, a memory consistency subcircuit. And um, then we can have a bunch of these for every memory axis, uh, checking the natural things. And now we can uh, uh, derive the final circuit, which uh, actually expects to get as witness both of the uh, representations. It gets the time sorted trace um, and has. Uh, T copies of the time uh, of the transition function uh, subcircuit. It also gets a copy of the um, uh, memory sorted trace, and then it has um, it works, uh, well, to support the worst case, also T copies of the memory consistency checking. And then it needs to make sure that, that the two are consistent. This is an additional component that is now needed because maybe every memory address is correct, but not for the instructions that were actually executed. And to check the consistency between the two, we use uh, a routing network that ensures that one trace is a permutation of the other. And um, in, uh, this uh, network needs to support arbitrary permutations. Um, so any value can show up. So any, uh, any point in time can show up at any point in the memory sorted trace, depending on the, uh, on the sorting. Um, but um, the routing network uh, of, uh, of the sorts we use can only express permutations. Every node can only either it gets two elements and either switches them or passes, or passes them along. And um, such a sorting network means that whatever the choices of the nodes are, 
the two sides of permutations and the actual choices, these will be another part of the witness to the circuit. Um, so um, that's, that's it. This is the cost. We get another factor of uh, a <coughs> O of uh, T log T uh, for the routing network, uh, just because the size of the, uh, the routing network is uh, T log T, uh, O of, but with very small constants. And no crypto anywhere here. So that's asymptotically, concretely, uh, these are the numbers. Uh, as, the, as you can see, the number of uh, gates that we spend are uh, roughly 1,000 cycles per step, plus uh, some small dependence on the rest. Um, and um, there is also dependence on the uh, program size, because it comes up into the transition function. We had it hard coded in the transition function. So this is for uh, small programs. We'll deal with large programs later on. Um, let me mention a couple of tricks uh, that we uh, use for uh, making things more efficient rather than just writing a Boolean circuit uh, like any electrical engineer would do when faced with an, uh, a new CPU architecture to implement. So one very natural thing, but very important, is uh, making full power of the thing that we live in. Remember that the SNARK forces us to work in a large prime field, and uh, um, um, forget the prime. It forces us to work in a large field, and um, that means that uh, the expressions that we write are. Uh, uh, the QEP can deal with large numbers. Why, do, why give up that power? If we were constrained to dealing with Boolean circuits, then just to support something like a multiplication instruction uh, on, the, the, on words consisting of W bits, we'd require W squared bits. That's unfortunate. Uh, because uh, with field operations, um, we can do it using a single field multiplications as long as there is no wraparound. So we need the, the fields to be sufficiently large, much larger than the register size, which they are. And we also uh, need to fix uh, overflows to ensure that uh, they don't accumulate. Uh, so that requires more gates. Overall, roughly two W gates inst instead of W squared. That's very natural, and it happens all the time. Another trick, well, more interesting, is uh, using non-determinism. Remember that we are very fine computation. The prover knows what the results are, and uh, it can build on that knowledge. So consider the, the divide instruction, the slash in C converted into a div, a div instruction in tiny RAM. A Boolean circuit for divisions is rather cumbersome. It would be very expensive in the number of gates and eventually constraints. But we can just guess the result and verify that it's correct. And that can be done uh, very cheaply. Um, so we use these kind of tricks everywhere, in the register file, the multiple, uh, where that requires a multiplexer, in the memory checking, in the sorting. And um, we um, actually have a library of such tricks implemented into what we call gadgets, uh, a nice uh, object-oriented design for uh, our framework for building um, the R1CSs, uh, there's a library of gadgets. Some of these look like gates that you're used to, ends and ors, and some of these are slightly higher level, like multiplexers. Um, some of these are whole CPU components. And uh, these gadgets are carefully written to use the underlying power of R1CS while usually encapsulating it so you don't have to worry about it. So in principle, you can do something much more efficient just by using the right gadgets. So let's summarize what we have. Um, there's a prover and a verifier, and um, a, the, the underlying prover that we got from QIPs uh, and linear interactive proofs and, and uh, with pairings on top, uh, it likes to get an input and uh, also uh, some sort of uh, witness Z, and it produces an output and a proof. Um, and um, well, 
sorry, it produces a proof, and the proof will be about the statement about the output of the computation that comes from outside the proof. And um, we, uh, we're going to uh, want these to uh, have the, the cost that I specified earlier, uh, put otherwise uh, um, um, quasi-linear uh, performance of the prover and uh, very efficient verifier. It will end up being uh, polylogarithmic um, and constant for reasonable parameters. Um, if the proof size will be constant for reasonable parameters. Um, and then there's the generator that needs to uh, generate randomness and uh, also uh, to decide on uh, what's the bound on the running time. The prover and verify need to know that. But more importantly, the prover needs to fix an R1CS. So the generator needs to fix an R1CS that everybody will use because that is enshrined in the public key, sorry, in the proving key and the verification key. All the proofs will be with respect to that. Um, so uh, the R1CS is generated from a tiny RAM assembly code, and uh, a, the prover gets a tiny RAM interpreter for executing the assembly code, and therefore uh, it also generates the witness that the uh, R1CS prover will need. And it also generates the output that completes the, what the statement is, the y in the x and y, or f of x equals y. Um, <coughs> then there's a compiler for generating these from the C programs. And uh, the cost is, as stated, uh, t log t uh, for the preprocessing snarks. Um, and uh, then this, we, at the end of the day, uh, once we have fixed the C program, we plug it through the compiler to get uh, the machine representation, we plug that uh, into the uh, R1CS generator to get a representation of uh, R1 constraints uh, generated from an intermediate representations of sorting networks and such. And when the proof comes to shove and the prover talks to the verifier, he actually runs the tiny RAM interpreter to generate the witness uh, which is the, the Z that is needed by the R1CS prover to produce the proof. So that's the whole picture. Questions so far? This is a great time for questions. Um, I have a question regarding the online memory checking with the Merkle trees. I didn't yet fully understand why this has to be done at the front end and cannot be done at the back end. The backend is not even aware of the concept of uh, memory. It has no notion of the RAM machine, of memory accesses. It does not know what it needs to verify. So um, it, um, it, it, it cannot check it's something that it knows nothing about. It has to be fed in, into it as part of the R1CS system. Um, but foreshadowing uh, my next session, um, some of the uh, advanced front ends, uh, sorry, advanced back ends will include internally uh, a front end that invokes another back end, and, th and there uh, this will come up. So um, keep posted. <coughs> Okay, our next issue is uh, that snarks require setup and, um, okay, isn't snarks require setup and um, ideally we would do the setup just once by running the, the generator to create the proving key and verification key and then we can prove statements about the given function f many times. That's great. Um, and if we can really amortize the setup over uh, many executions, then maybe uh, its uh, quasi-linear cost uh, is not that significant. In practice, it's comparable to the prover time when you're going to prove many times anyway. So maybe no big deal. But there is a cost there. And there, it is annoying that uh, we have to amortize uh, things in order for, uh, for this to go away in terms of cost. And even more importantly, this setup is trusted. There is private randomness. Uh, internally, the, uh, the queries uh, created by uh, the linear interactive program query algorithm. And um, those are encrypted, but anyone who, uh, who sees them 
um, will uh, be able to, to convince the verifier of false statements. Soundness goes away. So this issue of program specific, what we have here is program specific snarks, if we uh, go by the, uh, the previous construction, because uh, the um, generator actually got a program and built an R1CS for the specific program. If we change the program, we have to run the generator in U and justify uh, the, the, the trust in it. So we need, uh, if someone runs many programs and maybe chooses them ad hoc, we would need some uh, always available trusted service to uh, do the uh, parameter setup, which is very annoying. Um, so what we can achieve is uh, snarks with universal setup. Um, we can uh, build um, a snark, which is still a preprocessing snark, but, um, and it still has private randomness, it still requires trust, but the setup only needs to be ran once. And we can actually achieve this with the caveat that um, there it will be a bound on the computation that uh, the given, a given set of uh, parameters, proving key and verification key, can support. And this, is, this seems inherent, right? Because uh, we're going to build an R1CS that checks all the computation. Clearly, uh, if the computation size grows, the R1CS will need to grow with it. That's obvious. It's also false. But we'll see why later. It requires uh, amusing techniques to uh, circumvent this. So concretely, again jumping ahead, a performance for uh, T-step programs in the implementation uh, from uh, from uh, the uh, the relevant paper, which is uh, BCTV 14 Usenix. Um, uh, that's. Um, uh, that can be summarized like this. And, uh, we have uh, programs that run for T steps, and we can generate a universal pair of proving key verification key for such programs. And um, steps here will be tiny run instructions. Uh, the running time of the prover will be roughly 50 milliseconds times T on a typical uh, benchmarking machine we used. The full details are in the paper. And the space uh, will be roughly three megabytes per step. So well, let's start with these numbers for a bit. 50 milliseconds per instruction as opposed to a nanosecond on in native execution. That's a large overhead. But maybe there are things that are short enough for this to be useful. Uh, you can imagine scenarios where short programs do important things. Um, Three megabytes per step is annoying. It means you can't run many thousands of steps without running out of RAM. And uh, because there is an FFT in there, we will need pretty much random access to all of that space. Um, so this will be the bottleneck. And addressing this bottleneck requires the same uh, trick that lets us keep down the size of the R1CS. Not a coincidence. The R1CS dictates the size of the memory. <coughs> So what's the high-level picture? Uh, we're going to, uh, to have the same snark as before uh, as our back-end. But in the uh, front-end, we will create a circuit which is universal. It's a circuit uh, parameterized by the number of steps t, and it can verify any program running out of t steps. Um, so the circuit generator will get a bound on the program size. Uh, it will also uh, uh, get bound on the program running time, as we said. And it will also need a bound on the size of the input, because that too affects the R1CS. Given these bounds, it will create a circuit um, that uh, gets uh, everything that goes into uh, the function and um, so into the program and checks the consistency. Um, and it's, it's universal in the aforementioned sense. It's uh, a asymptotically efficient in the sense that the dependence is quasi-linear on the sum of these parameters. In particular, if the, uh, 
the program is dominated by the time, then it's uh, essentially uh, T O of T log T as before. And concretely, uh, if you look at the number of um, gates per, um, per execution step, we end up being not much worse than before on the order of a thousand or slightly more instructions, sorry, gates per instruction. Um, and this is actually, uh, okay, so it's, uh, it's somewhat larger than before because uh, this particular uh, evaluation was on the, on the tiny RAM machine with 32-bit registers, the previous one was 16-bit registers. And uh, curiously, because we are now working at the level of uh, universal programs, uh, we can add an extra feature of programs that modify themselves in runtime. So in principle, uh, you can run uh, self-modifying code or even just-in-time compilers and uh, check that they operate it correctly. So in terms of expression, expressive power, this is as powerful as it gets. Now the circuit generator starts similarly to the one before. Um, it uh, goes through tiny RAM and uh, there's a time sorted trace and we check every instruction uh, with the next one um, using a, 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 a transition function consistency. Uh, but the transition function this time does not uh, test the choice of instruction. There is no instru internal instruction fetch in there. It only checks the um, in relations between the registers, essentially the ALU of the CPU. Then, um, sorry. Then we also need to. Um, to uh, fetch the instructions, and we can, can no longer hard code them in the um, transition function. But what we use is just borrow a page from the design of modern processors, which use a von Neumann architecture. Von Neumann architecture means that the code is part of the memory, and every instruction fetches, uh, sorry, every time cycle the CPU fetches the next instruction from the memory. So um, we already know how to check consistency with the memory using uh, a memory sorted trace and a sorting network, ensuring consistency between the time view of things and the memory view of things. Um, and what we do is augment uh, the, uh, the circuit to uh, fetch not just data, but also code by the same mechanism. There are many implementation details to actually making it go through, but this is the uh, intuition. And uh, the cost here is uh, linear in, uh, in, in it's quasi-linear quasi in, uh, in the time, um, as you can expect. Reading and writing to the memory is uh, done using the same routing network as before. Yes? Okay, that's a great question. Um, if uh, things are done uh, adaptively as the program executes, then um, how can we know what the sorting network would look like? This kind of sorting networks, uh, in, in principle, any switch can be affected by uh, any memory access. And this is again where the difference between execution and verification comes in. At the point where we produce the proof, we have already completed the computation, we know what memory accesses it, it did, we already have copies of the traces, and uh, we can compu compute the corresponding uh, switches for the sorting network, and then plug all of this into the circuit to verify. From the circuit's point of view, it's as if there is non-deterministic advice about the values of the switches that it can verify. So we can now do uh, a one-time trusted setup to verify any computation of a given size and moreover do it in zero knowledge. Um, and uh, let's summarize this part of the discussion um, by uh, recalling the, this slide from earlier and uh, posing the uh, big <coughs> question of doing all of this but more efficiently and now we know that uh, 
more efficiently here is affected by many things. It's affected by yesterday's backends, and it's also affected by uh, the front ends. And in particular, this front end uh, is expensive. A thousand gates per instruction. It's very little compared to Intel's instructions. It's huge compared to what the instruction really does at the end of the day, which might be adding to registers. A thousand gates for adding to registers is a lot. Um, and uh, this is where we do pay for the generality and uh, self-modifying and the universality. We do pay for that inefficiency. Again, driving us towards the bottom right of uh, my X graph. And uh, this would be a good time for questions and a subsequent break. No $100 break. for the solution? Um, just eternal glory. No more efficiency will define. Yeah, the, we should define the price as a function of the uh, efficiency yeah. improvement. No, that would make it interesting. I have a question. I always wanted to know the answer to this, and now I can't answer. Why did you do this work? Because you must have known that the So the question uh, was, why did we bother doing this when it was uh, clearly a large overhead? And um, we, the answer is that this is, uh, this is exciting. We can actually do uh, something very general. And we can now measure its, its efficiency and tweak it. And when we started doing it, actually, uh, we feared it would be a lot worse. Getting this down to 1,000 was a major effort. And I'm sure that we'll see this uh, uh, decreasing significantly. So, so, no, I mean, I'm always saying that's clear. I'm asking why this was the first thing we tried to do. Like, my first approach would not be letting me take a general kind of CPU and represent it. It wasn't the first thing. The first thing we did, of course, was to uh, just program things directly in a low level presentation. And then we faced uh, the choice of whether, it, of which branch to take. Um, the one of, uh, a convenience for the programmer um, a, for expressing the a constraints class of computation or uh, full generality and driving in the point that anything that uh, can be computed can be done with uh, tight parameters or somewhat tight parameters. Uh, and actually, since there were parallel efforts that took the other branch, I think it's very fortunate that we picked this one. <laughs> I would like to contribute some uh, other uh, interesting uh, insights about this. Um, as far as PCPs are concerned, the ASIC approach is not clear how to carry it through. So in parallel to this effort, we're also working on PCPs where we already had good understanding of generic reductions for sort of computations. And so sort of this correlated skill is also reflected in these generic reductions for SNARKs. PCP is one of the reasons that we still don't have them for specific applications is that they're very difficult for, to program for specific applications. In some sense, they want to speak a generic language, and uh, you're forced to pay for this universality. Preprocessing SNARKs are wonderful mm -hmm. in the sense that they give you this freedom to uh, tailor them uh, with ASICs uh, and sort of make them already practical today for special applications. Yeah, <laughs> very, very much so. Um, and. Um, um, I think that um, when we move on to, uh, eventually move on to uh, new ideas in the construction of SNARKs, uh, it could be that they would also have this property like PCPs where universal circuits, roughly circuits that have a lot of structure, repeating the same sub circuit over and over like happens here. Um, uh, these may be uh, much cheaper for the underlying backend to execute the uh, arbitrary circuits uh, of the same size. That's not true for R1CS. R1CS has, does not in any way exploit the fact that uh, there are, there's a million copies of the same small number of constraints offset from each other. Um, for PCP-based SNARKs, uh, if you look at the algebraic constraint satisfaction language, in which, which is their native language, the one analogous to R1CS, then uh, it rewards you generously for having these kind of repeating structures. Uh, so you have this uh, sort of fixed time bound, you can have a universal circuit, 
Now, what, why can't I break the computation and then to, uh, as long as it's good for the verifier, I just break my instructions. I see the only point is that the memory needs to be verified across to uh, Yes, so definitely, if you, uh, you can always break the computation. Uh, there will be uh, two main reservations. One is that uh, uh, you will have indeed to keep consistency <coughs> of the state and memory and register file between these, uh, and you would have to do it in zero knowledge if, you are, if, if zero knowledge is desired. And the other one is that the proof size will then grow with the number of chunks. If you want to keep the proof size down, then you'll have to wait for the next session tomorrow, uh, to a next session. Thank you very much. <laughs>